That's Marduk. So the, the story of Marduk, I'll just give it to you very briefly. Tiamat and Apsu are locked in embrace at the beginning of time. Goddess of salt water, god of fresh water. Together, chaos and order, right? They give rise, masculine and feminine, they give rise to the world of the elder gods. And those are, to me, they're primordial motivational forces. They're something like that. And uh, their rage and their lust and their love and all these things that possess us that are there forever. And they're, they're out in the world acting. And they carelessly slay Apsu, their father. And they're making a racket, and then they kill Apsu. And then Tiamat gets wind of that. And that's Tiamat right there, by the way. She's kind of a rough-looking creature. And she's the mother of all things. And so she's not very happy about this. They, they, these, her children have destroyed structure itself. Plus, they're noisy and careless. And so she thinks, all right, just like Noah, just like the God that brings the flood to Noah, exactly the same idea. Tiamat comes back and says, yeah, OK. Enough is enough. I'm going to take you out. And she makes this battalion of monsters and puts the worst monster there is at the head of the battalion. His name is Kingu. He's like a precursor to the idea of Satan. And she lets the gods know, hey, I'm coming for you. And so they're not very happy about this because they're gods, but like, yeah, she's chaos itself, right? She gave birth to everything. This is no joke. And so they send one god out after another to confront her. And they all come back with their tails between their legs. There's no hope. And then one day there's a new god that emerges, and that's Marduk. And the gods know, as soon as he pops up, they know he's something new. Remember, and this is happening while the Mesopotamians are assembling themselves into one of the world's first great civilizations. So all the gods of all those tribes are coming together to organize themselves into a hierarchy to figure out what proposition rules everything. And so Marduk is elected by all the gods, and he says, Look, I'll go out there and I'll take on Tiamat, but here's the rule. From here on, you follow me. I determine destiny. I'm the top god. I'm the thing at the top of the hierarchy. And all the other gods say, hey, look, no problem. You get rid of chaos, we do exactly what you say. Now, Marduk, he has eyes all the way around his head, and he speaks magic words. Those are his primary attributes. And so he takes a net, and he goes out to con confront Tiamat. And, and he... he, he he encloses her in a net, which I think is so cool because it's an encapsulation, right? It's a conceptual encapsulation. He encloses chaos itself in a conceptual structure. He puts it in a net, and then he cuts her into pieces, and he makes the world. And then, then he creates human beings to inhabit that world and to serve the gods. And he creates human beings out of the blood of Kingu, the worst of the demons. And that took me, it was a Colin de Young, who was a student of mine, helped me figure that out. He thought, geez, that's pretty damn pessimistic. It's like, you know, what exactly? It's like a fall metaphor. It's like the idea of original sin. But, but our joint conclusion with regards to that was that human beings are the only creatures in creation that can truly deceive. Right? We have the capacity for evil, just like... It says in the Adam and Eve story, we can actually do that. And that's why we're made out of the blood of King Uda, king of the demons. The, we are the thing that can deceive, that can twist the structure of reality. Well, so Marduk. Now, the, the Mesopotamians had an emperor, right? And the emperor was the avatar of Marduk. That, that's what made him emperor. He was only an emperor if he was going to be Marduk. He had to be a good Marduk, which meant he had to confront Tiamat, chaos, and cut her up and make order out of her pieces. And what the Mesopotamians used to do at the New Year's celebration, they'd go outside their walled city, and that's explored territory versus unexplored territory. They'd go outside their walled city into chaos, and they'd bring all the statues that represented the gods, and they'd act this out. Because they're trying to figure something out, right? They're trying to figure out what this means. They're acting it out. And then they'd take their emperor, and the priest would make him kneel, and, and they'd take all his king all his king uniform off, his emperor uniform off, and make him kneel and humiliate him and nail him with a glove and say, okay, how were you not a good Marduk this year, right? And then he'd recount all the ways that he was inadequate in f confronting chaos, and then they'd do the celebration and Marduk would win and, and the king would go sleep with a royal prostitute. And, and uh, the reason for that was it's the same idea as St. George pulling the virgin from the dragon. It's exactly the same idea that if you, if you encounter the reptilian chaos, you can extract something out of it with which, if you unite, you produce creative order. That's what they were acting out. 
And, and that was the basis for the Mesopotamian idea of sovereignty. It's so smart. It's so unbelievably smart. And, you know, the Mesopotamians had a massive influence on the civilizations that then had a massive influence on us. It's one of the stories of how the notion of sovereignty itself came to be. It's the evolution of the idea of God. That's one way of thinking about it. But even more importantly, it's the evolution of the idea of the redemptive human being, right? And that's taken to its, one of its conclusions, well, in the story of Buddha, but also in the story of Christ, the idea of the perfect individual. And the notion is, well, that's the word that speaks truth into chaos at the beginning of time to generate habitable order that is good. That's the story. And so with that, let's see. Oh, I'll, show, I'll just show you these pictures because they're so interesting. Wouldn't you know what they mean? They're so cool. That's a symbol of infinity. Well, that's Hercules and the Hydra. Well, what's life like? You cut off one head. What happens? Seven more grow. Right? Well, what do you do? Run home? Well, no, that's not what you do. You, this is what you do. You fight it. 